the time from a log goes from 2 to 48. And after 48 hours, you're in involution. And that's why we put ours in 12 hours, and we take it out each day, and it moves up this. And then at 10 to 14 days, we do a process of taking a little bit of this and putting it in a new one, and that's called a subculture. You want a subculture before this thing gets too old and dead. What causes it to die between 10 and 14 days? Because it's in a refrigerator. Refrigerators dehydrate. Put rice in a refrigerator tonight with the top off. Tomorrow will be concrete. If you want to make good rice again out of it, you have to put a little water in it, put a top on it, put it in the microwave. It will uh, rehydrate. But refrigerators dehydrate, they remove water, and if you remove water from a living thing, you kill it. So after 10 to 14 days, our bacteria has to be remade. If you take a little bit of that bacteria and put it on a whole new slant and put it in overnight, that's called subculture. So how do we, here's a test question, how do we artificially maintain log growth in our cultures for doing your unknown test? Refrigerated subculture. <coughs> so you incubate for 12 hours and refrigerate and subculture every 10 to 14 days how we artificially maintain log growth for, to run all our unknown tests. And what we're trying to avoid is involution. And when does, here's a test question, when does involution first occur in a growth <coughs> curve? Somewhere in stationary and always in death. So it's always in available in death because death is where they are dying at a logarithmic rate because of the huge increase of waste and no nutrients. So somewhere in stationary? Somewhere in stationary is when involution first occurs. And it continues and is always in death. All right. So if you don't believe in the earthquake, or you don't believe in the tooth fairy, or you don't believe in Santa Claus, believe in the growth curve. Because you can take one E. coli and put it in a bra and come back every hour and measure its cloudiness, it's called turbidity, with a spectrophotometer and plot it on log graph paper and you will get the growth curve. Every living thing does it. And you can prove it to yourself by doing this little experiment. And sadly, back in the days when we had 18 weeks in a semester and more money than God, we used to do this experiment. Now, all that's left is our unknown test and gram staining, acid fast staining, and spore staining, and using the microscope. So we have basically eliminated probably 40% of all the labs. And if you go to physio, I think they eliminated 90% of the labs in there. Sadly, they used to do a lot more. Now they do all these old things where you measure your heartbeat or something that doesn't require supplies. All right, so if you do put one E. coli in a broth and you come back 10 hours later, you will have 1,048,576. That's a lot of growth. All right, so next part of this chapter is how do you measure growth? And of course, everything in science is direct or indirect. So if I wanted to measure how many people in this room directly, I would have her, funny face over there, say you're number one. Who would you be? And you? Three, four. That's direct counting. Or I could count heads, or I can count eyes and divide by two. That's all direct counts. I wouldn't want to count legs because some of you could have been in Afghanistan and got one blown off. <laughs> so those are all direct counting methods. 
And direct counting methods are neither better nor worse than the others. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain each one of these counting methods and you need to tell me which one it is. Is it direct or indirect? And what's good about it and what's bad about it? So let's start with simple counts. Remember, what are we doing? We put E. coli in a broth and we put it in the incubator and now we want to know how many E. coli are there in there. So you take the broth out, you mix it well, you take a drop and you put it on a slide and put a cover slip over it. Stick it under your microscope and focus under oil and go, one, two, three, four. How good is that? Crap! Why? One, you probably got 50,000, and she'd probably be going, I'd be going 38,331, 38,332, and she'd go, Dr. Hicks, and go, one, two. So that's a problem, and then what color are bacteria? Clearance. Right, against a white background with a white light. So you can say there is nothing good about simple counts. I can't think of anything. I can't think of any reason anyone would ever use them. I guess that maybe you could use them in, to see if uh, your bacteria is dead. <laughs> All right, the next one, the answer is the answer to the question, which of the direct counting methods would you use if you need to know now or soon in a production factory. So if, and it's called serial dilutions using methylene blue and a micrometer. All right, so what's a serial dilution? It's so you won't have to count 50,000. If you take a sample and you mix it and you take one mil out and put it in nine mils of sterile saline in a sterile tube and mix that and do that four times, you'll get down from 50,000 to about 50. Which would you rather count, 50,000 or 50? 50. So almost all counting methods involve serial dilutions first. How many do you usually do? Four or five. You know, if you get too few, you want to go back one. And remember, you're keeping these when you're doing them, mixing them and keeping them, so you can go back one with no problem. So remember, they always involve serial dilution. Next to make them visible, methylene blue. If you put methylene blue in a bacterial culture, it will stain living cells light blue and dead cells will be navy blue or black. There's only one problem. In 15 minutes, methylene blue kills everything. So you can't do it well in advance. You have to do it just before you're going to do the counting. And finally, what's a micrometer? I still have one in here. We quit, again, it's something we used to do a lot, but we don't do anymore. It is a slide with an exact volume cut into it with a cover slip with a grid to make it easy to count. So, what do you do if you, what's the best direct counting method? You take a sample, you dilute it at least four times, you add methylene blue, and then you put a tenth of a mil into a slide that holds that exact volume, and you put a grid cover slip over it, you go one, two, three, four, five, six. Remember, you count all of them that look like round things. Then you count the light blue, and you can get a percent live. So what's the good and the bad about this? One, you've got to have all those things sterile, and you have to do this quickly. Remember, you got 15 minutes. And secondly, when things die, they often split into two pieces. So is the black dot one single cell or one cell that split into two? So it's slightly inaccurate because uh, dead things often fall apart. Um, so let me give you an example about this. Uh, this is used a lot in micro, and I want to just advise you of something, and that is don't be good at it. You do not want to be good at counting cells with a micrometer. Uh, when I came here from, from Atlanta, from the CDC, my job, you know, Ronald Reagan fired everybody uh, in AIDS because it would never become a problem in the United States. And I was hired here by Jonas Salk because Jonas Salk had an idea. You see, anybody know about Jonas Salk? He was the guy that made the polio vaccine. And when I was in 
grade school, about 10% of our class was crippled from polio. It was the fear disease of our parents. Most people got it in the summer, and the reason we found out later is it's a naked virus, which makes it very hard to kill, and it's in the poo and pee, so if somebody pees in a swimming pool, then that virus, chlorine, doesn't kill it. So you can pick it up that way, and remember it kills the neurons uh, in, that innervate muscles. So uh, there are three different kinds of polio. One kills the um, nerves that innervate the legs, one the arms, and one the lungs. The worst one to get, of course, is the one that innervates the diaphragm, so they have to be in an iron lung to breathe for the rest of their life. Um, so anyway, everybody was afraid of it, and so Jonas Salk was the person that developed the polio vaccine to prevent it. And one of the things that people are still shocked about is 200,000 parents in the United States volunteered their children in grade school to test the polio vaccine. No one would do that today. But it was such a fear, and so many people were willing to take the chance because they, you know, they were told it was a killed vaccine. Well, anyway, after the vaccine was approved, uh, Jonas Salk was still in charge of the project, and one of the factories that made the polio vaccine, I believe it's in Lima, Ohio, or somewhere like that, um, one of, a little of a town in Ohio, uh, the people there did not adequately kill the vaccine when they made it. And so a number of children were infected from a poor batch of the vaccine. Now, Jonas Salk, was a different man than today, people we have today. You know, when the banking crisis happened, did any banker stand up and say, I made a mistake and I take the responsibility for it? No. Was any of them tried? Did any of them go to jail? Yet they almost brought down the entire world economy. So when this happened, <coughs> even though he was not in charge of the factory, he was in charge of the program. Jonas Salk went on television and radio and took responsibility. And he said, I will make sure this never happens again. I realize it was one of my underlings that I appointed that failed to make sure the vaccine was adequately killed, but I will put new safeguards in there that will make sure this never happens again, and I take personal responsibility. And people took him at his word, and when the Nobel Prize Committee came, they did not give him the Nobel Prize even though he changed history with the polio vaccine. Now, the American people forgave him. And if you recall, anyone ever heard of the March of Dimes? March of Dimes was a charity set up uh, because Franklin Roosevelt had polio and he was very worried about it. And so he got together and a number of other charities got together and started the March of Dimes where children would do odd jobs and bring dimes to school that they would then send to the March of Dimes to pay for research for a polio vaccine. And so once the vaccine was effective and was preventing polio, you remember there's only two countries in the world now that have polio. And there wouldn't be any if it wasn't for September 11th. There are a couple countries that won't allow, um, like Afghanistan and, and Nigeria, that won't allow, uh, in certain regions, the uh, WHO to go in there and vaccinate because there is these rumors that it's an American trick to sterilize Muslims. So that has stopped the eradication of polio. But we hope that it will be the second disease eradicated from the earth after smallpox. Well, anyway, um, after all of this happened, the March of Dimes collected money and gave Jonas Salk a research institute in La Jolla. It's a beautiful place. If you ever go down there, try to go and see. It's in an olive grove on the cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It's made of imported brown marble. It has an artificial stream down the middle of it that pours over the cliffs into the ocean. Anybody ever seen Iron Man? 
You know that sort of saucer-shaped house that he lives in? That's Jonas' salt house that the March of Dimes built for him on the cliffs. And so uh, the March of Dimes gave him this research institution, and it says right there on the front, sorry, I still get chills, because polio means a lot to me. Uh, with grateful thanks from the American people and the children of the United States of America. So, what Jonas Salk did, this institute, is made up of, I believe it's six buildings, and each building is unique because Jonas Salk is sort of a spiritualist. He's not, he was Jewish, but he wasn't practicing kind. And he believed in spiritualism, but not in a particular religion. And so each one of those buildings is dedicated to a different facet of the human existence. So there's a building for medical research, and a building for cancer, and a building for genetics. There's also a building for psychology, and a building for spiritualism, to research all the areas of the human existence. It's, to me, it's just amazing that a scientist could be fascinated by everything in the world that makes human, humans different. So anyway, um, and how I came to be was associated with him, I met him several times, was that he always hired the brightest people in the world for his institute, Salk Institute. I mean, whoever was the smartest and the brightest is who he hired there. He also, all the people he surrounded himself, you know how your mother says, you know, if you lie with dogs, you get fleas? If you associate with really smart people, it might rub off. So he surrounded himself with brilliant people. And his executive assistant, he replaced every two or three years, was always some gorgeous girl from some incredible, private, brilliant college like Vassar or Brown back east, you know, where the super, super smart and the super powerful send their uh, female children to. So, one of, back in the uh, late 80s, he was doing his Jonas Salk thing, which was every day he went around and was to Model Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I should have gotten the Nobel Prize. I was decent about it. I took responsibility. One day, his executive assistant, the lady, looked at me and said, Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing about it. You're richer than God. You're smarter than hell. You have the resources that no one else in the world happens. Guess what? You didn't get it. And you're not going to get it. And you can't revise history. So get over it. You're smart. You have resources. You're everything in the world anyone else would want. Shut up! Get out there. You're not dead yet. You're only 83. Get out there and get another one. There are people that have won too, you know. And he said that. You know, he usually didn't take that from anybody. I didn't say he was a wonderful person. I said he was brilliant. I said that he was incredible and powerful. I also said that when he came in the room, you could feel the intellect. Have you ever been around someone like that? Where... You know, it's sort of like I, I went and shook hands when uh, John Paul came through. And you could feel something was different. I know, I don't believe in, that's not science, but there's something there. A presence that you can't define, and that's what I saw and I felt when I was around him. And so, um, anyway, he didn't take anything off of anybody, and he was a very old-fashioned person. So anyway, it was kind of shocking that he accepted her. I don't know, she probably got let go real soon after that, but and another really pretty girl probably took his, her place. Seemed to have an affection for that, too. Uh, but anyway, um, he started thinking, you know, there is, and she said, you know, AIDS is out there. You want something really hard? That's it. So, he came up with a theory and his product was called Remune. 
And his idea was this, which has been, by the way, recently reinforced, was that when the body is infected by HIV, it doesn't think it's been attacked in a major manner. So it kind of throws part of the immune system at it. And it isn't until it's already infecting and destroying the immune system that the body realizes this is a critical infection. And by then, it's too late. So his idea is that immediately after someone turns HIV positive, right after they got infected, throw everything in the human immune system at it. Which, by the way, they just found recently that if you use these really strong antiretrovirals, a series of three or four of them on babies, you can clear the infection. So he may have been right. Anyway, his idea was take HIV, grow it up, purify it, kill it six different ways, and inject massive amounts into people that just turned positive. So that was the uh, program that I was hired when, because I was one of the few people that could grow HIV. So my job was to grow it, to kill it, and then, uh, by the way, I didn't say that he was terribly a social person, nor did he respect people's boundaries. When he hired me to do this at, in a, in a uh, laboratory about six blocks from the racetrack down in Orange County, uh, right across in, what's the name of that little town? One, there's a big racetrack right down there, just off the 605 and the um, freeway. Yeah, I don't remember what the name of it. But anyway, we were working with deadly viruses two blocks away. <laughs> and so I killed it, and here's the funny thing. He, gave, he would come by, no notice, no call, just show up in his limo, pop open the door, walk in and say, how's the virus coming? And I'd say, well, this batch looks pretty good. And he'd say, okay, here's my car phone. Remember, they didn't have cell phones. Here's the phone for my apartment in Paris. Here's my phone for my, apart my penthouse in New York City. Here's mine in La Jolla, my office. Here's my house in La Jolla. The moment this is ready, I don't care at the time of day or night, call me. It's like having the personal phone of this guy was like freaky. <laughs> and of course, he didn't care what time he called me either. You know, three in the morning. How's that going? It's three in the morning. I don't know. But anyway, so one of our jobs was when the bar we took a chemostat, which you'll learn in just a few minutes about, and a big jug, sixty liters of. We would take a human cancer T cell line and that's what they love to infect, T-cells, and we would feed it calf serum or blood serum and we would run 60, 60 liter chemostats a week. And every day those chemostats had to be counted with a micrometer, each one of them, to see if they were 50% dead. Remember when the cells, T-cells are infected and reproduce the virus, they explode. So when it gets 50% dead is when we start preparing to harvest the virus. So somebody had to be at work at 3 a.m. every day to pull the samples. It had to be three people because they had to pull them all at the same time. And then remember, you can't add the methylene blue unless you're going to count it within 15 minutes. And then they had to count them because at 7, when the rest of us came in, we had to know if we were going to harvest that day or not. Viruses don't care what time it is. So, anyway, once every three months, my boss would sponsor a competition. Okay. Come in on Saturday, get double time, I'll take you all out for steaks, and we're all going to count the same chemostat, and the three people that come closest to my number win an extra $200 a week in their paycheck and get to come in for three months at 3 a.m. <laughs> and count the chemostat. He's <laughs> never any good at it. It is not a reward. Okay? And five years later, I called up one of the girls that still worked there, and I said, what are you doing? 
She said, hemostats, I'm counting. And I said, are you kidding me? And she said, no, I'm really good at it. And I said, you have a master's in microbiology and you're counting cells every day at 3 a.m.? You think that maybe you kind of wasted? A dog could be trained to do this. <laughs> and she said, you know, I can never sort of slack off like you did and not do my best work. <laughs> well, never mind. All right, so anyway, don't be good at counting these. We'll talk about Renee a little bit more. All right, serial dilution standard plate counts. You know what serial dilutions are? When you do your serial dilution, the last dilution, instead of doing it in sterile saline or nutrient broth, you do it in melted oil. Then you pour it in a plate, you stick the plate in the incubator overnight, and come back the next day and count the dots. That gives you a very good live count because of the theorem in microbiology that says one bacteria equal one circular dot. It's called the one bacteria, one dot rule. It's never been proven, but it is assumed that one bacteria will divide concentrically and produce one per perfectly round dot. So if you count the dots, you know each one of them represents one bacteria that was alive yesterday. And then this one you take the liquid you want to count, you pour it through a filter that has a 0.22 micron filter. There is no bacteria smaller than that, so all the bacteria stay on top of the filter and the liquid comes through. You take a pair of tweezers and you turn it upside down on a nutrient auger plate, pick it up, stick it in the incubator upside down overnight, come back the next day and count the dots. So these are all direct counting methods. So, Here's a serial dilution. Start off with 50,000, you mix it up, you take one mil out and put it in nine mils of sterile saline or nutrient broth, and you've got 5,000. Do it once more, you got 500. Do it once more, you got 50. You wouldn't want to do it a fifth time because five is a little bit too low to be confident. All right, so that's a serial dilution, and everything has a serial dilution in a direct count. And here's a micrometer. It's a slide with an exact volume with a grid, making it easy to count. And remember, you have to add the methylene blue, but you can't add it more than 15 minutes ahead of time, because in 15 minutes, they'll all be dead. Methylene blue is actually used. Did you know that both crystal violet and methylene blue once were antiseptics? What's an antiseptic? Even now in veterinary medicine, uh, you can go and if your dog or your cow, I'm sure you all have cows at home. <laughs> cows have great pets. Yeah. But anyway, they get tangled up in barbed wire. You get, get them out of the barbed wire, cut it away, wash the wound, and they spray it with crystal violet because these dyes are toxic to bacteria. So they still use methylene blue and crystal violet if you've ever seen in poor countries, you'll often see people with purple stains. That's where they use crystal violet, a very cheap disinfectant. We don't use it here because people don't like to walk around in purple on We're like <laughs> uppity. All right, so here's the serial plate counts. And, oh, I, I already told you the defect in the methylene blue method, and that is black dots. It's Living, I mean, dead cells can split into two and you can count it and make a slightly off count. All right, this is serial plate clamp. You do your dilution, but the last dilution is in melted auger. Then you pour the plate and you put it in the incubator overnight. And then one thing, what's wrong with this one? Got to have all these things sterile. That's annoying. But if you find out tomorrow what today's count is, how can you go back in time and harvest? To make an account for that, they plot it on graph paper and they can predict. But they still, this, this one has the big effect of you know a live count is accurate because you've got dots for each one. But you find out tomorrow what the day's count is. Yeah? Is that a machine or something? Yes, they do, and that's indirect. We'll talk about it in a minute. All right, so next um, is the filtration method. And the problem with it, it used to be called the millipore method because millipore was the only thing that made a filter this small. Now everybody makes them. 
but you make a fil filter that's 0.22 microns small, no bacteria is small on that, and you pour your liquid in here, you hook it to a vacuum, and it sucks it through, and all the bacteria stay on the filter. Then you pick it up and lay it down on an auger plate, pick it up, lay it down on another one, pick it up, lay it down on another one, you have a replicate, put it in the incubator, come back the next day, take the average, and you have a great, trusting number of your live count. But it still has the same defects as the last one. Find out tomorrow what the day's count is. And you have to have all this equipment, and you have to keep it sterile. All right, so let's talk about indirect methods, and don't let me forget dry weight. I forgot the other class. All right, a chemostat can be as simple as the ones we had, and that is a glass bottle with a stirring rod in it that went around and around. That's what we did. We took a closet in this strip mall, and we built wooden shelves in it, and we put a heater in there that was on a thermostat that kept it at 98.6. And then we put these 60 liter bottles, and each one had a little motor with a paddle that kept this aerated and stirred. That was our chemostat. And we grew HIV that way. Um, fine. Since we were harvesting the whole thing, no big deal. But in production facilities, you would want to use one, like if you were in Eli Lilly making human insulin in E. coli, you would want one of these. These usually are about uh, between two and 5,000 gallons, and they are a huge stainless steel cylinder, and they have probes in them to make sure the pH is right. They have a paddle in there keeping it all mixed. They take, add nutrients and oxygen at the top, and they suck off product and waste at the bottom. And you can go for up to one year with one of these fancy chemostats, and you can have a little paddle in there that has a hole the size of one of your bacteria, and every time it pa a bacteria passes through it, it counts it, because it breaks an electrical field. So this is a very fancy chemostat, and I just would like to tell you another thing I learned in line, don't be an intern in a microbiology laboratory. My father heard that I wanted to be in microbiology, so he thought he would let me know what real corporate microbiology was. So he got me a job as an intern for Merck Sharp and Don't. And the first two months, my job was cleaning chemostats. Mm -hmm. Once a year, they take them down because you can never get all the poo out of them. And you go in there with a pair of rubber gloves and a steel wool, a steel wire brush with a little acid. And you clean every square centimeter of the inside of this thing. And you can imagine what it smells like. And it's hot. Because you're in a little spacesuit thing, so that you don't, you know, if it was a dangerous microbe. Do you want to break into that? They have that? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I also work with specific pathogen-free turkeys. Specific pathogen-free animals are animals that have never been exposed to any pathogen on Earth. So they kept in absolutely sterile environments where they never touch anything. And can you imagine a turkey raised in basically one of these and then what their poop, how much poop builds up in a year? I had to clean those up too. The other job I had was uh, <laughs> quality control, and we'll learn about it, I had to take this part of the factory. When I complained about this, they transferred me to uh, antibiotic quality control for erythromycin production. So every day I went and picked capsules off the, the uh, production line at random, weighed them, and then took them into the lab where we mixed the antibiotic with nutrient broth and inoculated them with bacteria stuck them in an incubator overnight, and every morning I read 1,500 tubes for cloudiness. That's what he wanted me to learn, that being a microbiologist in quality control in a production facility was not very exciting. It was very repetitive. So, anyway. So, chemostats, what's their advantage? You can artificially maintain log growth for up to a year. You 
can get huge production, problem, eventually you still got to take them down and clean them out. Because you can never get all the waste that way. And some of them can be horribly expensive, like the ones for Lily that are a little over half a million dollars a piece because of all the electric probes and they're connected to a computer to keep everything balanced. Um, I'm going to talk about one that's on the list that's just before this and it's called dry weight. And this one is an indirect method of measuring how many bacteria are in a fluid. And what you do is you measure a piece of filter paper's weight on an ultra balance that does, you know, down to a ten thousandth of a gram. Then you pour a solution you want to count through it and you stick it in an oven till it's zero humidity at low temperature so you get rid of all the water. Then you reweigh it and you can calculate how many bacteria it would take to change the weight of this piece of filter paper that much. It's indirect. Okay, but there's a problem. You have to kill the bacteria to count them. Remember, you have to cook them. Get rid of the water. Yeah. So it's an indirect method of measuring Num numbers? bacterial number in a broth. It's called dry weight. So not a terribly good one, but it is one. All right, the next one is most probable number, MPN. Anyone ever see the movie Aaron Brockovich? One of yeah. the best movies ever made? She was hot too. <laughs> All right. And by the way, the guy that was in it, her co star, just died last week. You know, the guy that was her boss, the lawyer. Well, anyway, uh, Aaron Brockovich is about what we're going to talk about now, and that is the U.S. government has a book called Standard Methods. And in that book, you will find what the U.S. government and the FDA say that is the legal experiment to measure anything dissolved in water. So if you want to find out, like she did, chromium-3, wasn't it, she was trying to find? It was a, a metal that was a byproduct of, um, what were they doing? I forgot what the power company was doing, but it was a byproduct of their, it, it's a very toxic cancer-causing chemical that they were, the um, Edison in California was used was allowing to contaminate the groundwater. And they were saying there's no proof it was cancer, and she's saying there is proof, and here are all these people. So anyway, to find out how to count how much that is, you have to buy the book and do the experiment they say they will legally recognize. All right? So, in that book is most probable number, and it's the legal experiment that says how many E. coli per milliliter there are. Basically what you do every day in LA County, the LA County Department of Health goes and takes a sample from every reservoir, every pumping station, every public swimming pool, and every beach swimming area that is county controlled. And they run MPN on it to see how many E. coli. Because E. coli, do we worry about it because it's dangerous? No, it's an indicator that mammals have poop there, and when mammals are sick, it's in their poop. So we can't look for the diseases in the water, but we can look for the byproduct of poop, which is E. coli. And so you take the sample, and you dilute it in nutrient broth with a Durham tube in there. And the first, you do 10 samples for every dilution. So you would do it 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. You do it all the way up to 10 to the minus 50. And then you take all of these tubes and you put them on a rocker in a room at 38 degrees overnight. And you come back the next day and you start with the um, least dilute. And you move up and you find the first row that has one more than half of the tubes positive. How do you know they're positive? They have a gas bubble. Then you look up in the reference book and it will tell you how many bacteria it would take to make that row, the first one positive, per milliliter of, of fluid. 
So this is a way, it's called standard methods in water treatment, and it's a way to standardizely measure the amount of E. coli in any water sample. So any question I have about water and counting bacteria, the answer is most probable number. Now one of the most exciting things, remember when I told you back in the old days when there were 18 weeks in the semester and we had more money than God, we used to have a trip to the world's largest sewage and water treatment plant, and that is Hyperion, just south of LAX. <coughs> and it is an incredible visit if you have kids that you want to get turned on to science or something like that. Remember, there are only two things that people really remember, sex and poop. So you take the kids to watch the poop factory. And if you go down there, every week they have a presentation where you go in and you see this little video of how the plant takes sewage and converts it into drinking water. And remember, by the year 2020, we live in a desert. And the federal government has said we can no longer do what we've been doing forever, which is steal half the water from the Colorado River and then drain lakes in Northern California so LA can continue to increase in population. We live in a desert. And so by the year 2020, every drop you flush down the toilet must come back out the tap. There will be a closed system. Now, we pump it three miles out to sea, 40%. The other, we blow up around the freeways and, and use them to, to water the plants on the freeways to keep the dust down. And as it trickles down, it will clean the water. Problem is, when we do that, we lose half to evaporation. Yeah? Sir, what was the name of the place that you were saying? Hyperion. Hyperion? Hyperion Water Treatment Sewage Treatment Plant. So anyway, uh, it's really fun. Uh, it's one of the two best jobs in the United States. There are two jobs in the United States for the least amount of education, you get the most amount of money. BSRN and a BS in sanitary engineering. It always bothered me, but sanitary sounds like a napkin. I would much rather call it sewage engineering, but never mind. The current term is sanitary engineering. And they hire you, your beginning salary is $45,000 a year. And you get a, you intern. You know, it's one of these old systems where a person has to go into the process and they have to work as an assistant for a number of years. What do they call that? It's not intern. What? Apprenticeship. Apprenticeship, yes. And then you get $5,000 a, year, a year raise every two years that you have a good evaluation. And you're, of course, kept on the job. If you don't have a good evaluation, bye-bye. So anyway, uh, like one of the girls here, who graduated with a BSRN, well, she got a, her prereqs here and then went to um, USC and got a BSRN. And then she got divorced. So she didn't care about a real life. She decided to uh, specialize in emergency room and she took every double shift they offered and all weekends and all holidays. And her first year, she made $110,000 with a BSRN. So those are the two best jobs for the least amount of education and this sanitary engineer. So what they do is they show you a little video of what they do and then they take you out to where the big sewage things come in. And they tag some effluent that's coming in from the sewers and you follow it through the whole plant. And then back at the end, after they take it through the whole plant and through the filtration, the water treatment, ozone treatment, they hand you a glass of water and say, drink this. And then the guy will drink it right in front of you. And you have watched that go from poo to water. So when you come in, the first step is the mash. And they told me to tell you this when we used to go there every year. The masher is this giant paddle wheel. And when stuff comes in the sewer, there are lots of solids, so they have to mash them and resuspend them in the water. And the problem is, every three hours, they have to stop the mashing and take a rake and rake the tampons and condoms off the mashing. Stop flushing them. 
Put them in the landfill. Don't flush the condoms and the tampons, please. They clog up the masher. So once they re-suspend it, that's true. No, but why does it say that on the It's okay for you. Yeah. It's okay for you, it's okay for them, but it's not okay for the sewage system. <laughs> All right. It means it's not going to mess up your pipes. It doesn't mean the city's not going to mess up. All right. So anyway, once they resuspend all the solids in the liquid, it goes to the first settling tank where they add something very similar to talcum powder to the liquid to get the particulate matter to settle. Then they pull the effluent, the liquid, off the top, take it to the secondary settling tank where they add more and get more of the particles out. Then they take the liquid off of that and they blow it up into the air because UV light kills viruses and it takes the stink out. Then they put it through an ozone or chlorine treatment and primary filters. Now, it's called third stage, and they pipe it out to sea, three months. We're dumping stolen water from Northern California in the ocean. Is that not stupid? So, in the future, they will put it for an ultra filter, and will be the same as your Dasani water. That's LA water through an ultra filter. So, by 2020, all the water that we steal must come back out cannot pipe it out to sea or put it up over the freeways anymore. Yeah? What's the deal kind of with the other one, that big tank with the Virginia Tech? Yeah, yeah. And then they were like... That's where they captured the methane gas. And then the solids, by the weight of the gas being produced, kills all the bacteria. And they use the solids as for fertilizer. And the gas in Europe, they use to power all of their buses. It's hilarious. Here, you know what we do with the methane gas? Let it out to create more, more uh, carbon emissions and a thicker atmosphere. In Europe, they capture it all, bottle it, and run the public transit system on it. Weird. Why don't we do things like that? It doesn't make any sense. Never mind. So anyway, any question that we ask that has involves water, what's your answer? Most probable number in the end. Okay. Last but not least, if you're asked what is the best of the indirect methods, we're not talking about water, we're talking about the best in a production factory. What was the best of the direct for a production factory? Direct. Serial dilution, methylene blue, and a micrometer. The best of the indirect methods, if you need to know now, is turbidity. Remember what I told you? I took erythromycin, I diluted it at the correct concentration in nutrient broth, and then we inoculate it with the bacteria that erythromycin is supposed to kill. Then we incubated it overnight, and we brought the tubes back, and we put them on a little uh, vibrator here that shakes them and mixes them, and we stick them in a spectrophotometer that shoots a light beam through the crystal glass tube and clear fluid. And however much of the light beam is blocked by cloudiness, you can plot the number on log growth paper, I mean log uh, graph paper, and use a formula to figure out how many bacteria it would take to block that much light. Remember, if it's crystal clear, 100% of the light will pass through. Anything less will give you a level of cloudiness and you can predict the number. So this is the best that you need to know now of the indirect methods. And it's incredibly quick. I mean, you can do it in 15 seconds. Well, you know, it takes a good 10 minutes to do uh, the direct. Of course, the direct method with the methylene blue and this micrometer is a better number than this one. Oxygen determination. I don't think we need to go about over thioglycolate broth again. Two things you do need to know is that if any, any time metabolism is done in an oxygen environment, there is the production of free radicals. Free radicals destroy DNA. So if a living organism is going to do metabolism in the presence of oxygen, it's got to have a way to detoxify free radicals. And it takes two enzymes to detoxify free radicals. 
superoxide dimutase breaks down the free radicals to hydrogen, water, and uh, hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. And then since hydrogen peroxide is also toxic, it takes catalase to break down hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. So remember, these two together are necessary for something to live in an oxygen environment. So what organisms have that? Aerial tolerance, facultatives, and aerobes. What doesn't? Obligate anaerobes. Because obligate anaerobes are killed by oxygen. That's why clostridium will swell up a can. Because cans have no oxygen in them. They produce a gas, but you kill them when you allow oxygen in them. Vocabulary. Any microbe that lives below 5.4 is called an acidophile. Microbes that live between 5.4 and 7.2 are called neutrophiles, and those are the ones that cause disease. Most of them. Remember, there are, there's one famous acidophile that causes disease. What is it? Back in the 70s, when you got bleeding ulcers, what did they tell you your problem was? Stress. Nervous. Stress. What do they know it is now? Heliobacter. Heliobacter pylori is a bacteria that lives in the stomach under acidic conditions and eats holes in the side of your stomach lining causing bleeding ulcers. 90% of all bleeding ulcers are caused by Heliobacter pylori. Yeah. Is that, is that H. pylori? Mm -hmm. And all you have to do to be tested for it is basically blow into a minor balloon and they will then run a test on in a laboratory and a 14-day um, treatment uh, with antibiotics, which are not the nicest antibiotics on earth, they're real strong, will get rid of it, and you'll never have ulcers again. Amazing that something we thought was caused by stress and nerves and acid was actually a bacteria. And my nephew always had bleeding ulcers. They took out three quarters of his stomach before later on they discovered that it was a bacteria. So how did doctor would you go to have that test for the person? Any. Any. No. Your regular GP can do it. So where does that They send it off to a lab. And where do you, how does that get with your stomach? Kissing. Kissing and eating after people that already have it, you can get it. That's how ulcers travel in families. We thought it was hereditary, but it isn't. It's kissing, mm -hmm. sharing food, sharing utensils. All right, so uh, things that live, my, microbes that cause intestinal would be alkalinophiles because they live at high uh, pH. But remember, most of our bacteria are 6.8. Let's talk about temperature vocabulary. You think there are three words, there are five here. Things that live on, uh, bacteria that live on ice, zero and below, anything below 15 degrees centigrade, which is considered a warm refrigerator, are called hypercyclophiles. From refrigerator temperature to room temperature is called a cyclophile. From room temperature to high fever temperature is called a mesophile, and those are most of the microbes that cause human disease. From 41 to 50 centigrade is a thermophile, and from 50 to over 100 is the hyperthermophile. Remember, things that live in boiling water are hyperthermophile. Any questions? We're going to fly through here. Okay. Uh, this is, do, don't forget that um, salt is required for most things to live. Hardly anything will live in pure water. Those are called non-halophilic. Uh, we have the same dissolved salt in our blood, in our cells, as is, is in the ocean and whatever we came from. And that's called a moderate halophile. And hardly anything will live on salt. But a few things will, and they're all bright colored. Uh, if you ever go and look at a cattle farm, or even deer hunting, you will see that the hunters and the farmers will put out salt licks because they're, you know, not much pure salt in nature and animals need salt and they get their salt and minerals from a salt block. And if 
if you leave one out there for a year, you will notice when you walk by it, it's got bright red and orange and green growth on it. It is bacteria that are what we call extreme halophiles. They live on salt. They don't eat salt, they just live on those high osmotic conditions. Okay, we're going to see how smart you are right here now. Yep. We're going to find the optimum temperature for a bacteria. And remember, there's a million bacteria, a million enzymes in a bacteria. Keep it alive at one day. So let's say that 999,998 of the enzymes in a bacteria, their optimum temperature is 37 degrees centigrade. Two, the optimum temperature is 25 degrees centigrade. What's the optimum temperature for the entire organism? 25. These are essential. So the definition is the optimum temperature is the maximum temperature of the weakest enzyme. Optimum temperature for any organism is the maximum temperature of its weakest enzyme. What do you need to know about endospores? Nothing you don't already know. Isn't that lovely? So remember, what do we already know? Endospores are not reproductive. They're survival structures. They are uh, only made by the genus two genera, Clostridium, which is anaerobic, Bacillus, which is aerobic. They are composed of a spore coat that's resistant to almost everything except for pressure and high heat. You can kill them with certain chemicals like glutaraldehyde or uh, 200 and, 225 degrees centigrade for 15 minutes at 31 pounds per square inch of pressure. It's the autoclave. Um, what, is the spore, what is the spore made of? It is not called a spore, it's called an endospore. And it's made of, the coat is made of diplocolinic acid and calcium ions. And it resists radiation and almost everything except pressure and high temperature and a few very difficult chemicals. Uh, what else? I don't think of anything else. It's just the things we learn for our uh, endospore. Okay, so last in this chapter is we're going to talk about media. Things we grow bacteria in is called media. And we can define media by what it's made of or what it does. So by composition and by action. Alright, so anyway, media. By composition. Remember when I was telling you about me growing this HIV for Dr. Salt's experiment? I just wanted to tell you the results. After many experiments and much testing, and by the way, uh, the person who did the phase three trials was Alexander Levine. Anybody remember her? We talked about she's the one who established hope as a scientific criteria. All right? So that's how I met her. Was in a way, I look back and I think, oh my God, all the things, incredible things that happened during that time. And you kind of want it back and then you think, oh my God, it was a horrible time. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I met her because she ran the trial and she ran the trial for us. And what we found out was Remune worked, but it didn't work. And what do I mean? It worked in a quarter of a percent of people. That's not enough for us to make it a product or to get it approved by the FDA. So while it did work in a few people, it did not work in a, in a what would you say, a, a wide section of society. Uh, one of my exes actually is the one that worked at. Did I tell you about the uh, person, my ex, that said he didn't want to use condoms anymore? Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> anyway. I met this guy who's really great and we were great together and three years into the relationship he says, I don't want to use condoms anymore. I want to really be dedicated to each other. And I said, well, I guess, all right, uh, but we're going to have to test. 
and I said, you know, since I do the um, HIV test in my laboratory, 